So, hello and welcome back to the one YouTube channel that the better I do, the worse looking my setup becomes. I finally exited the great white void and arrived into a um, very messy living room area. I've thought it was maybe a little bit more engaging than the white void, but in the process I've discovered how little I understand lighting and angles and pretty much everything else. But at least you get to see that I do own, I, you know, a bookshelf. So that's probably quite exciting. Today I'm going to talk about a book that no one's ever heard of, which is why I can't even put the title pretty much anywhere, and that is... Oh, I have the physical copy, look at this. Ta-da! This is a Corpus Chrome Inc. by S. Craig Zeller, and uh, literally nobody's ever heard of this one. I found it in a secondhand shop. I do pretty much all of my book acquisitions via secondhand shops. You can find some incredible stuff. There's about... 10 in the city I live in, and so anytime I go into town, I just sort of hit as many of them up. And Corpus Chrome Inc. was a very interesting pickup for me. I was intrigued by the sci-fi setting. I thought maybe it would actually be good or interesting. I like sci-fi dystopia, and that's essentially what this promises to be. And it took me down a, um, an interesting rabbit hole of life, basically. So, a fun fact about me is that I don't really feel anger properly, you know, I just lost that ages ago, and it's perpetually, I'm just very chill about things, um, sometimes I get, like, hyper with, like, a re restless need to fix problems or whatever, but I never really feel, like, full-on anger, um, which is to say that, like, Corpus Chrome Inc., I, I hated it with this inspired passion, I mean, I just, I just resented reading every single page. I resented the author for doing this to me and so much about it. So this is quite a complex book. Um, it's this far future world involving radical and kind of idiotic changes to technology and culture. It weaves these three narratives that basically never touch over several busy months. The writing is horrible. It's exactly what you imagine, like, a too smug man in an MFA to show off at a workshop and then refuse critique on. Like, the tone and the story are all things that just add to this feeling that the author, the author really believes that we live in a society and he's figured it out. Like, it's, it's super violent, it's very gruesome, um, there's a lot of torture that acts as sort of a entirely pointless diversion in this story that completely lacks a climax, and by the end, it barely pretends it, like, has a purpose at all. And also, it's, like, weirdly really racist. I mean, it's racist to the degree that I actually assumed the racism was the author trying to be clever or, um, honest in some way, like it was his dark satire commentary, or that, like, the racism was, like, set up as a plot point, or that the character was written racist on purpose and that was just a character trait. Like, that is the level of racism going on that I was, f most of the book, kind of convinced that it was a purposeful, smug writing choice by a bad author and not just literal racism. Um, and then I googled the author, which I am a big advocate for kind of like death of the author in that there's sometimes knowing about the author adds certain things, and in quite a lot of my book reviews I've mentioned certain things about the author. I think that otherwise people will speculate on certain things, so if I completely leave out the author then people will speculate, oh I think the author's like this or this, and then I might want to clarify one or two things. In other circumstances the author, you know, may have a really important reason that we bring the author into it, but overall I don't like to do it too much because I think that we have a tendency when we look at really bad books to start psychoanalyzing a complete stranger, and um, I like to avoid that. But uh, like halfway through um, Corpus Chrome Inc., I was so blown away by what was going on, I was like, I need to look into this man, and I need to figure out what's going on. And um, yeah, okay, so he's actually a successful screenwriter and director. He says that he's um, apolitical, but his last film is this sort of pro-police racist fantasy starring, you know, Mel Gibson. So he's not exactly rejecting certain viewpoints um, for somebody who says that, you know, he's just making art and, you know, doesn't have any political opinions or whatever. Yeah, um, 
basically, I think that perhaps the uh, racism in the book is not actually a clever commentary satire thing. I, I don't think that's quite it. So, um, regarding what I've learned about the uh, author S. Craig Zeller, I'm kind of reluctant, like, <laughs> like, I do rate these books, I often at the end of my reviews, I haven't been saying my rating because I think every single book I've reviewed at this point has been like a zero stars. S. Corpus Chrome, um, you know, when you're <laughs> a racist, you just sort of get a zero stars for your book. In truth, there's sort of like one or two glimpses of interesting ideas-ish going on, but it's in this crazy mess of, I mean, Moon Squid Hell is my selling point for this, and I'm not kidding about Moon Squid Hell, and I'm putting it so simply when I say Moon Squid Hell, I'm going to probably read the multiple pages that Moon Squid Hell is in this book, and it will just sort of keep escalating for you. Anyways, you know, maybe I would have given this book, like, one star for having a couple unique ideas in it, but the sheer writing and everything else about it and the racism, yeah, we're not gonna look at this book favorably. It is definitely never worth buying, not worth reading in my honest opinion, and uh, the only reason I still have it on hand, truthfully, is I do like to keep some of my favorite bad books on hand. I don't want to keep this one, but I feel too guilty to donate it to a charity shop again because I don't want to inflict this on someone else. RJ the Third leaned over and grabbed Architect, limbs sprouting obliquely from the furry mass, a purr-like tires redistributing gravel emanated from deep within the bloated beast. The skinny man in silver stroked the feline between its ears and inquired casually, as if to trick Champ, What did you think of the Moat Aquarium experience, the first and final rocket? Page 25. So, I, I love my speculative fantasy and sci-fi, but I really need to have a section ahead of time to just lay down some facts of the world. And... There's some pretty key facts in this case. It is 2058, and things are really different. It's interesting to compare what 2050 looks like in all the various futures. Corpus Chrome Inc., or CCI, is definitely more on this extravagantly wild side. New York is now Nexus Y, it's the twin city of Brooklyn, which is now a major city on par. The world is at peace thanks to the World Senate, which takes 12% of all revenue from anything. Seatbelts are now pseudopodia, they're like a fungus, and fungus balls, in fact, are accurately used as lie detectors. Movies, TV, and books are all replaced by a um, moat aquarium experience, which is really hard to describe. It's sort of like 3D narrated shows inside of fish tanks. Cities are just towers built upon towers where these flying wagons weave. Cloning is banned, but the titular company, Corpus Chrome Inc., is allowed to bring people back from the dead. For like 30 years or so, CCI has been able to put frozen brains into mannequin robots. The adaption is difficult, and not all can cope with revival and using their new body, but thousands already have. There's just a lot of these revived people. The process is seemingly entirely random, too. So while you sign up and you register a dead person and, like, you preserve their brain, there's no waiting list, there's no order to it, no one else knows how the technology works, and no one knows what process they pick the brains, like, the order. Basically, CCI has a monopoly on life and death. Much is unknown about CCI the company, too. Uh, they're hardly forthcoming, and large details about, like, their even their office, most of the upper floors are secret. So, you know, there's a mystery there. And the world of the actual book CCI, it's a bit confusing to say the company's CCI and the book is called CCI. Hopefully you can tell the difference. And the world has some pretty interesting concepts. Some are so weird that they don't even feel derivative, which is quite nice, honestly. I... I don't think it's a bad thing if a book is going to do something I've seen in another book before, but it's always cool in sci-fi to see something entirely new. However, it simply just doesn't know what to do with all of its new ideas and world. Like, the central plot promised by the book and the universe is all about CCI and these mannequins that revive from the dead, 
And actually, the role in the story is pretty much negligible. The actual whole plot that you'd assume about a mysterious company that can bring people back from the dead is almost entirely unimportant in the actual plot. There's three plot lines in CCI which barely touch each other. They're each very different in tone and, I guess, purpose? Though assigning purpose to them feels like a stretch. I'm going to try and roughly do this by character, sort of. Um, I think that's going to be the best approach to summarize it. So, there's three storylines, we have three main characters. The least seen, most minimal storyline, but also the most important one, is that of racist lawyer lady. Her name is Alicia, but like on her first chapter she makes some crazy anti-Semitic and racist comments, so the whole book internally I was like, oh, racist lawyer lady. And Alicia, she works for a law firm that represents CCI. CCI has just decided the next person they're going to revive will be this rapist murderer who was executed for his crimes. Alicia protests this because why would we bring that guy back? But her firm is being paid like an extraordinary amount of money to broker this deal. Uh, the murderer's mother is extremely rich and giving up like 97% of her wealth if they bring her horrible son back from the dead. Alicia opposes it on moral grounds and tries to sabotage the deal, but she's caught and fired. We skip a month forward to where Alicia is being interviewed. It turns out in the time skip, her husband and daughter were gruesomely murdered. Her interference in the uh, really bad murderer's revival basically slowed the revival enough that that murderer's mother died. And the murderer's mother was so upset about this that she got some assassins to go and make Alicia's family die. So in response, Alicia joins a terrorist cell. So the murderer, meanwhile, is successfully revived and he holds a press conference in his new robot body. So what follows is best described as bonkers. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna quote and recap and I'm going to read the full thing, I think, at the end of this review, because I really do want to read the multiple page section of what happens when this um, murderer comes back from the dead, because it's insane. But I don't want to read the whole thing in the middle of my review, so at the very end, check in. I, I always do chapter segments at the bottom, just please check it out. Anyways, recapping a many page long plot point that is mentioned twice more and does not impact the story at all. Here is what the murderer says. They injected toxin into my paralyzed body. I faded and died. I wake up inside a lunar body that orbits the Earth. From this dimension, or overlapping cluster of dimensions, the Earth looks like 10 or 11 overlapping violet spirals. But still, I recognize it. The moon I'm in isn't our moon. It's made of some matter that's unlike what we interact with, but it is covered and has energy. It might be dark matter or maybe something entirely different. The interior of the shadow moon is hollow and filled with billions of craters. Within each of these crater areas is something that looks a lot like a glowing squid. So that's page 120. The murder explains this is the afterlife. We all have a spirit body, a squid that lives in an invisible shadow moon above Earth. When we dream, our squid eyes are slightly open, seeing images in the hollow moon from other squid's glowing eyes. Mentally ill people are those with their squid eyes wide open. When we die, our squid body dissipates into nothing. However, however, if we have ever killed someone, even accidentally, our squid body physically is altered. Then, when we die, as, as a killer, we ascend from the moon and fly through space for days. We then explode into squid goo and keep flying for days. We go into the sun, our sun, and float around as squid goo, unable to move, speak, or do anything but think about our past life and every mistake we've ever made. This is squid hell. Each second in Squid Hell is like a week. This torture never ends or changes. And also while we're here, there's definitely no Squid Heaven. There's only Squid Hell. 
So, uh, yeah, the um, the murderer who's been revived from the dead says this at a press conference and immediately is assassinated by Alicia. And the plot continues. And Squid Hell factors into the book 0%. It is brought up, I believe, two more times to um, no purpose. Great. So Alicia uh, kills the guy who reveals this great thing. And she just continues to work for the Terra Cell for a bit. Until the very climax of the book, where um, she doesn't do anything, but basically she stands nearby while some other people raid CCI's headquarters and explode it. And Alicia regrets watching, like, the tower explode and all the deaths, so she walks into the wreckage to die. And that's the end of her storyline. Isn't that a satisfying storyline? So... The second storyline is that of Liz Ann. So she's a composer mourning the death of her twin sister, Ellen Nancy, who died three years ago. The twins founded a musical style called sequentialism, which is where only one instrument plays at a time, which is kind of an interesting concept. But since Ellen Nancy died, Liz Ann hasn't done much more than, like, produce music for new age metal bands. She goes on a date with a girl named Osa, who, which doesn't go well because Osa immediately accuses her of being a fake lesbian because Lizanne is bisexual. So, yeah, and that, that would be bad enough as, like, just a weird thing to include in your book. But then Lizanne kind of makes it worse by saying that she is bisexual, but the main reason she wants a serious relationship with a woman is because she wants another strong female presence in her life to replace her sister. Like, that's... Yeah, yikes. And, like, Osa leaves because of that. Because if I was on a date with somebody and they said that, I'd be like, no, I think that that's a very big red flag. And yet, um... Osa and Ellen Nancy... Um, Osa and Lizanne, dear God, bump into each other again, and they just start dating, like, a week later, so it's fine. Let me read you a quote from uh, this man who definitely knows how to write women well. <laughs> so, Osa appraised her date's torso. The apparel did not in any way obscure the fact that Liz Ann had flattened her breasts. And this is in parentheses. The petite blonde felt that it would be better for her date to have a moment of disappointment now rather than later, when a startled hesitation or a furtive glance or a minute, minute frown might prove hurtful. Page 42. That's how women think. I don't know what to tell you. Osa and Lizanne fall in love, but then Lizanne learns that her sister is going to be resurrected by CCI. Osa fears that this will pull their relationship apart. Um, Ellen Nancy then is revived, and she resents being revived, and she refuses to cooperate with her new body and, like, you know, testing that she's good at being a robot. But Lizanne is able to reconnect with her and their music and begins basically aiding her you know, regaining her musical skills. They bond. It's kind of nice, honestly, but it does mean that L um, Osa doesn't get to see Lizanne very much, so they fight and break up. When, at the climax, the CCI building is exploded, all of their computer systems glitch, which results in every single mannequin, every single, like, revived person, exploding. <laughs> This is done via a chapter where there's several new POVs, there's like five different brand new POVs, experience the exact same, like, arc of action. They're hanging out with a revived loved one, then they are splattered by their brain and guts as the robot explodes. It's this repetitive sequence that it just feels like the author is getting off on like, oh, shock gore. But it's the exact same event every time. There's no variation. It's just like five small little scenes in a row of wouldn't it be messed up if you're hanging out with your loved one and they exploded? Like that, it, it's, it's so baseline shock horror. It's just embarrassing, I would say. So Lizanne and Ellen Nancy are taking a bow for their new composition when Ellen Nancy's head explodes. Great. So a year later, we get a bit of an epilogue where Lizanne is, you know, getting better from that trauma and decides to have IVF. She winds up with twin daughters that she names Ellen and Nancy. She then crosses paths with Osa, who is fine, and they slightly make up, but not really. So, um... That's a really good plot arc, and honestly, re real talk too, as kind of 
bad that sounds, that is the best of the three plot arcs. The last arc is that of Champ. Champ is a divorced garbage man who is evidently, like, the hottest guy around. He's super down on his luck, and he moves into an apartment with this eccentric filmmaker, or I guess aquarium moat maker, named RJ the Third, and his cat that is genetically attuned to his mood. The flat isn't quite a roommate situation. Instead, Champ's flat is accessed through a trapdoor in the bathroom of RJ the Third's flat, as while they live on the sixth floor, the flat that Champ is renting is on the fifth. This is because it was annexed during a interfloor war that the apartment building is in, which is a common thing in the future where a bunch of apartment buildings are at war with each other in a very, like, high-rise, but, like, half of the buildings in the city are basically reenacting high-rise. The one that he lives in, though, is entirely done through pranks and raids. So, yeah, Champ's whole setup and whole story is a farce. I mean, not all of it, which makes it way weirder, but the beginning is all out of, again, like, a comedy high-rise. It is so obviously meant to be a comedy satire farce sort of thing. It's absolutely ridiculous. And I kind of think that maybe the whole book thinks that it's a dark comedy or satire, except only with Champ's plotline is there any elements of comedy. Let's read some of the amazing humor of this dialogue scene. This is RJ the Third talking first, talking to Champ, and um, yeah, I, I assume this is meant to be gut-bustingly funny, so I assume that you'll all laugh with this. And RJ talking first. So, you're depressed, single, and friendless? I wouldn't disagree with that assessment. Terrific. What do you do for a living? I'm a garbage man. That isn't going to make you popular. Nope. Anything else? asked RJ the Third. I did some stand-up comedy for a while, but it didn't work out. You don't seem humorous. Most people would agree with you. It's page 25. I mean, rolling on the floor, absolutely. <laughs> so Champ hangs out with RJ, his co-worker, a horny and sexist garbage truck driver who's always talking about how much he wants to run over attractive women and a snake-loving woman who speaks almost no English but is always topless in the apartment. Again, it's like a comedy farce. So Champ, though, he learns that his father, who died 30 years ago when Champ was like a kid, is selected by CCI to return. His name is Eagle, and he loves to party and make uncomfortable remarks about women. Eagle adjusts well to his new life, and he bonds with his son, mostly by partying and banging women. It's super weird. They, they're just hanging out together, you know, hooking up with women, father and son. One day there's a fire, and Eagle accidentally rams his fire truck into the building and kills four people. CCI enters a protocol to shut down Eagle's mannequin for retrieval, but Champ and his friends disable the tracker and Eagle. While they search for a way to revive Eagle safely, the terrorist attack that blows up CCI happens. All the mannequins explode, but since Eagle is offline, he's actually safe. They, years later, get Eagle revived. He confirms that when he was offline, his soul did not go to space hell. Like, he did not, he didn't become a space squid, and nothing of that happened. At that point, Champ comments that the whole squid hell episode was debunked as, like, a lie by CCI. But then RJ says that the global senate is lying about that to curb panic. And it's weird that we have these characters argue about Squid Hell when pretty obviously Eagle is confirming that he was just dead after killing some people and did not go to Squid Hell. So Squid Hell isn't real. Cool. Eagle um, then malfunctions pretty much immediately and the rest is conveyed in a very bizarre meta narrative sort of situation where Eagle is saved last minute, Eagle lives for many years in disguise as a human watching his son marry and have kids, until eventually he decides he's lived long enough and rides a motorcycle into the sunset to die. Those are the three storylines. Uh, the epilogue is actually several different epilogues that kind of, 
I, I have no idea what's wrong with the epilogues. They're all very odd choices. So, like I say, the ending is really a meta-narrative, which means that we never see Eagle go and live as, like, the last mannequin. It's actually a moat aquarium experience that Liz Ann's daughter is watching 30 years into the future that was written by RJ III. This adds some shadow to the idea of Champ, like, having this happily ever after. Like, our last real scene of, like, Champ and his father Eagle is Eagle's mannequin failing as it's woken up post-CCI collapse. So, with that in mind, perhaps the happy ending is just RJ, canonically, a hack writer, just imagining a typical story conclusion. But, I mean, what does it actually add if it is? If it's a fake ending, if RJ is just, like, imagining that Eagle got to ride into the sunset happily, what does that mean? Like, what is it saying? Like, nothing. The, the trick is that it's saying nothing. It's sort of trying to be clever here by saying, like, maybe this happened, maybe it didn't, stories, narratives, who knows. Except it isn't actually managing to say that. Like, the TV ending of Eagle driving to the sunset and the real ending of Eagle just dying immediately after differ very little as narrative choices. Neither offers a satisfactory conclusion for the storyline or the book or pretty much anything. <laughs> So there's three storylines to the book. There's actually a couple side bits to the story that I haven't mentioned because they're entirely useless to... There is no main plot to CCI, but the extra bits are even less of a plot. Like, I covered in the story, like, how Eagle wakes up and he confirms Squid Hell isn't real. However, midway through the book, there's the scene where a pastor is shocked by the news that several other resurrected men all of the murders had come forward and confirmed Squid Hell is real. This again bears zero impact on any storyline or the world or anything. I mean, again, the mentions of Squid Hell, I, I can't say this enough. Some guy says Squid Hell's real. Some other guys say Squid Hell's real. One of our lead characters said Squid Hell's not real. And that is the full impact and effect of the Squid Hell Afterlife storyline. But I think the strangest diversion that we have is a field trip. So at one point we join a field trip of students on a horrible diversion, basically, to the Empire State Building. And this is going to involve a lot of really nasty gore. So a warning on, oh my gosh, pretty much everything relating to gore, torture, and suicide as well. It's a very unpleasant little situation. So, these children are on a field trip to what used to be the Empire State Building. The kids are around 11, and it's set up as like this normal, exciting field trip via flying wagon. And they reach the Empire State Building Memorial, and this police officer then tells them this very long, very dark tale of the history of the Empire State Building. And what follows is just concerning. Like, I I'm using words like odd and weird so much, but it's just odd. I maybe I should also use cringy. <laughs> like, the author basically, again, takes a break here to go and, like, get off on imagining the worst torture he can. Like, this entirely... A lot of this book just feels like the author is titillated by imagining that you will be shocked at the gore that he writes. So, the police van. The policeman explains how when America was first going to join the World Senate, there was a terrorist cell that was dedicated to preventing this. One day, they took the Empire State Building hostage. There was nothing the government could do about this because they had thousands of hostages, and the president refused to negotiate with terrorists, especially ones who basically just hated the super UN. The terrorists began to get violent with the hostages. So they began to drop them off buildings wearing special suits that preserved their organs but broke all of their bones. So they lay alive in a goop suit screaming in pain. They did this to kids as well. They started dropping a canister of 50 eyeballs from different people 10 times a day. 
They started doing special surgery so they could hang living people by their entrails out of the windows. If the police got too close trying to euthanize these people, they shot the police down. People are also dumped from windows of mutilated genitalia after having commit suicide. And remember, with all of those details, this is being told to some kids on a field trip. It is excessively detailed and goes on for a long time until the building is detonated, killing about 80,000 people, and then the president commits suicide out of shame. And this is being told to some children on a field trip, and it is entirely pointless if you'll remember my plot summary. This is not a plot point. It's a gore intermission by a, you know, 13-year-old who is so excited to scare you with how dark he can be. It's like those creepy pastas that are just misunderstand the point of horror and just fall down to shock so strong it is no longer shocking. So, I wanted to talk a bit about, like, the point of this book. I'm not an advocate for the idea that all stories have to have a meaning or like a deep theme or like a point as it were. I think that things can and should just be fun or entertaining or make you think for like a second but not even in a deep way. But I also like it when stories are trying to talk about something and CCI has this really specific issue where it's so obviously trying to say something but it is also <laughs> definitely not saying anything. As I've said, and as is probably pretty clear by now, the book reads at all points like it is a man who believes himself to be a genius visionary and a dark comic mastermind, but at every single point it is simply trying, uh, let's see here, too hard, too poorly, and definitely too stupidly. Like, I enjoyed a couple small aspects of it, but all of those felt like an accident. <laughs> Not that this guy actually had any idea of what he was doing at any point. The more that you think about the story, the more you realize something is really off about it. And that's the the book doesn't know what it is. I mean, for a cautionary tale of the future, the mannequins are wildly underused. They, they really barely factor into it. For a monopoly on life and death, I mean, we never get answers on exactly who CCI chooses to revive. But also, we kind of can tell that, well, the murderer's mother paid a huge amount of money, so that's why CCI revived that guy. The reason they revived Champ is that he was a firefighter and he'd be good PR, so it's not a central mystery. It's not a theme, like this company that can control death itself. And by the end, they're destroyed. I mean, society moves past CCI and doesn't return to it. It's barely affected. The world and culture, in fact, doesn't seem to care that there are people constantly being revived by a shady company. It doesn't care while that's happening, and once it, like, it ends, they don't care. It just doesn't matter. I mean, for a dark satire, which the book definitely thinks it is, only Champ actually has frequent comedic moments. Alicia and Lizanne definitely do not. And, I mean, if it is a satire, what is it satirizing? CCI, the company, is barely touched upon. You could have a lot of fun with, like, a corporate satire about life and death, but that's not what this is about. Future society? I mean, it's not a source of satire, this weird future world. They're barely changed from now, a lot of our social culture and things, or it seems oddly regressive because there's rampant misogyny and racism everywhere. The book features the fall of CCI, the ones who have bested God, and then the book sort of rambles to an end without stopping and thinking about any of its half-baked ideas. In, I think, one of the worst examples of, like, lost potential, one of the many epilogues is two children watching a newscast a year after CCI has exploded. The CEO talks about his company and the truth of it, but there's no dark secret or intrigue. When this happened, I definitely thought like, oh, maybe there'll be something in this because 
obviously CCI is painted as kind of a shady company that can revive the dead but won't tell anybody how. I thought maybe there'll be some sort of interesting secret or an idea here. You know, it's the very end of the book, this is literally an epilogue, but maybe there'll be something. And um, no, what the CEO says is that the founder of CCI lived a life of loss, and he believed that if God didn't want him to bring back the dead, he would have been unable to bring back the dead. And that's it. At the end of the book, we basically learn a couple answers that we didn't want, which have changed nothing, and which our POV characters, the two children, literally flick off of without any particular remark. I mean, that's what ending the book feels like. It feels like I'm just changing the channel after watching an extremely boring newscast. And also, I mean, let's never forget Moon Squid Hell. Uh, th that plot point is completely unhinged. Uh, it comes up around halfway. It's this very long revelation speech, and then it barely exists. I mean, there's great potential here for, like, the returned dead proving the existence of an afterlife, and also the idea that the afterlife can be confirmed, but it'll be nothing like our religious thoughts. But the book doesn't examine that. When we, like, look at this plot thread, when you think about Moon Squid Hell, all you can do is wonder, what the hell is it doing here? Like, what is the implication of Moon Squid Hell? What are we supposed to take away? The book isn't interested in anything that it brings forward, but it has the air that everything it brings forward is its own master thesis on a crazy future of dark satire and intrigue. I mean, it's like CCI the book. It's like it shies nervous and blushing away from the concept of cohesion and like the threat of thought. Liz Ann felt warm air tissue from Osa's nostrils into her short blonde hair, heavy breasts press upon her back, two hearts beating in aquatic syncopation, and the curve of the tall woman's hip against her buttock. The Swedish Indian American was tall, and her presence was gigantic. Page 69. Like, Take me to the shed and do me in if I ever start writing like this. CCI is badly written. That's it. <laughs> End of thought. The characters all speak like robots in these really long sections of super mundane dialogue. Their names also have that horrible thing where they're replaced by an epitaph, where they're replaced by a single physical feature, or race, mixed with some of the most annoying prose. All of it also feels like slimy somehow. The experience of reading CCI is to be covered in slime. It's written by someone who thinks he's funny and clever and isn't, as I keep saying. I I've been using some quotes and I have a lot more quotes, and sharing them with friends has unilaterally evoked emotions of just repulsion. <laughs> so, oh my god, this is one of the worst ones. I'm sorry. Prompted by the breathy utterance of the lascivious adverb, Champ's phallus swelled inside his orange suit. The terms of your deal are understood. It's page 247. I think my least favorite aspect of the writing, bizarrely enough, is the constant use of titles instead of names, the epithet thing. It's a pet peeve, I think. Though it is rightfully considered bad writing, Lizanne, every other sentence, is the petite blonde, just as Osa is the tall beauty. Uh, my least favorite of these is RJ's, which is the popinjay. Do you recognize that word? Why do you recognize that word? It's an archaic term for a parrot or a dandy. <laughs> The use of descriptive titles like this is bad because the character already has a name and constantly calling them one or two other things can be confusing, and it certainly makes the reader kind of pause for a brief moment to connect another dot. It just makes the writing feel really janky and disruptive the whole time. In addition to janky and disruptive, the writing is often interrupted with very obscure words or else odd phrasing that makes it feel like the author had a thesaurus and a pledge to reduce the number of common words under a certain tier. Like, I mean, 
Is it anti-intellectual if I admit that big, long, fancy words kind of annoy me? Like, I love rarer words. There's a couple of them that I use way too much. Um, but CCI slips in these, like, really odd terms where they're not needed, and with a frequency that it feels like the author is trying to show off. Prompted by the breathy utterance of the lascivious, lascivi oh my god, lascivious, not elevate his prose if a perfect term. I mean, again, pop and J. The writing also uses parentheses. It's like it's trying to mark a list of these writing yellow flags. Nothing's forbidden in writing, really, but you do need a certain skill to pull off breaking all of the rules at once. I love a parenthetical, but it can almost always be smoothly replaced with a dash or even a comma, or the thought can be woven into a paragraph without being an aside at all. Like, you gotta think carefully about your intentions and not overuse them, lest your book be bogged down by these diversions. And also, people cannot speak in parentheses out loud, which is a thing that happens more than once in CCI. Here's a section to kind of exemplify all of these really bad writing choices at once, pretty much. Champ plucked a purpureal tube from his blue jeans, raised it to his lips, sucked a trilling B flat, and tasted cardamom. The mist was not powerful enough to impair behavior. The manufacturers took their psychotropics to the exact edge of lethality, a little further each year, but it was strong enough to, pay, to pat him on the back and say, Well done, sir. He then replaced the vapor tube in his jeans. Sweat beaded above his upper lip as he climbed the third flight of stairs, and he grew lightheaded, almost as if the air had thinned during his twenty-two meter ascent. Champ's foam rubber boot squeaked on something viscid. He looked down and saw the circular stain left by a suicidal pizza that had landed face down. The coroner had apparently decided to remove and eat the carcass. 23. I, I, I have to keep putting like these quotes in because I just need you to believe how bad this book reads and how unpleasant it is. I guess I've technically read worse written books, but there's something so obnoxious about CCI that a book that just is simply poorly written doesn't pull off as well. This is just annoying. <laughs> don't want to read the racism bits. Okay, um, the racism in this book. I kind of kept it to the end in its own isolation chamber, I guess. Okay, so CCI has a very strange relationship to race and racism. The book is not at all tackling anything related to race, so I can kind of take it aside here so that we can cut it out. But the inclusion of the insane amount of racism feels like bait. It feels like dark humor, in the author's interpretation of dark humor, that he wants me to hate, and that he's put it in here so that I will specifically call it out and then he'll say that, like, I just don't get it. At, at, again, at first, as I said, I thought the racism was a deliberate choice about Alicia that she was just racist but it comes up in other perspectives in the exact same way. So I don't know. I think there might just be something about the author. There's a lot of quotes about this. Um, it's, I, it's really rough to read any of these sorts of things. I mean, Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay, so for example, talking about the idea of, is this bait? is this one sentence. Also at the table were Potato O'Boyd, Bagel, Butch Goldberg, Pedro Chung, and a black couple. That's page 201. There's an Irish man named Potato, a Jewish man named Bagel, the black couple are unnamed, and also the Jewish man named Bagel is at one point called Silverberg rather than Goldberg for his last name which is the only typo I found in the book, which also gets this lovely anti-Semitic layer to it, you know, to just make that even more clear. I mean, the first obvious clue that the book has a race problem is in the referential titles, the epithets. 
It loves to call the characters the, um, you know, the brunette, the petite blonde, the rebodied man. But then also we have the Asian, the Indian, the chubby Chinese American. Uh, CCI definitely has this issue where every person of color is at some point simply defined by their race, if named at all, which is bad. It would maybe be evened out, not really, if at least one character was called, like, the white woman, but no, obviously not. Characters are only reduced to and referred to simply by race, only if they're not white in and or Jewish, obviously, because throw that in there. And the whole time it feels really jarring. I mean, racism is always jarring when it comes up in a book, but also we're in 2058. The way that the characters and the prose talk, it feels like racial tensions have heightened somehow. Osa, who is an important side character, is the only major person of color. And though she's usually just the tall beauty, her dark skin and nationality is dutifully listed at all times, as if to like assure her she is another. Like, she's just an other. She's not like everybody else, you know? She's the tall beauty, she's the dark beauty, she's the Swedish Indian American. Like, we're always defining people like this, and it always feels so weird. Um, I think that what I'm going to do for the um, my little <laughs> drive-by of my quotes about racism is I'm just going to put those ones on the screen for a couple moments rather than read about five of them in a row, because I have a bunch of them. <laughs> so uh, let's, let's just um, enjoy those for a moment, please. Also talk about in isolation just Osa and Lizanne and them as women and lesbians and just sort of that zone bisexual because yeah of course it's going to be really bad and I just have a little bit I'd like to say about how bad it is so Lizanne and Osa's relationship is a strong enough relationship I suppose but it definitely reeks at all times of someone writing women who just doesn't really grasp the idea of women. I mean, there's that classic men writing women joke of a hyper focus on breasts and bodies and it at all times feels like a man who is thinking that this is definitely how women behave and act and is entirely wrong. Osa and Lizanne often also stand out like the book is very nervous about gay people. I guess I'm glad that gay people get to exist in this world, but at one point a child quizzes them on who is in charge in the relationship, and Osa's family asks who is the man. This is 2058, like has society gone backwards so severely? I mean, them being a couple is often a point of awe. Everybody acts very odd about it, basically, in one scene. The only one where main characters cross paths. Lizanne and Osa are sexually harassed by Eagle and his friends for two pages as they ponder the notion that they are together as a couple. Like they are alien beings. And this is Champ, who is 30 years in the past, which would put him as from the 2020s. Okay. Pointing out Osa, the mannequin, Eagle, said, I'll take one of those. Leave me alone, said Osa. Eagle's friend says, I think the little one right there is your playmate. Eagle says, I've gone down that road before, said the mannequin. Champ's mother liked to... Dad, protested the handsome son. I like dykes. They're extra tough. And besides, how do they know that it's not a woman in here? The mannequin, Eagle, then wrapped his fist upon his chest like an orangutan. We know, said Osa. And what would you do with her if you got her? asked Eagle's friend, Bagel Butch. I've got equipment and an instruction manual. Illustrate it. Bleh, said Osa, repulsed. 
My parts are totally adjustable, added the mannequin. Lizanne leads Osa out of the elevator at this point. Looks like the little one is in charge, opined the tattooed Jew. That's 168 to 169. Eagle is, of course, the storyline that we end on since we're meant to relate to and like this character and care about his death. Also, I'd really like to put forward for um, whoever keeps track of this, the the sentence or I guess even just the dialogue tag, the, the four words that is opined the tattooed Jew as the worst the worst thing that you can have. Okay, so Osa and Lizanne, it's probably also worth talking about the beginning of their relationship, which is quite fraught. Osa spends a while accusing Lizanne of not actually being interested in women because Lizanne is bisexual and has been married to men twice, which is really bad. They fight about this, that's their first date, but then they make up. But though Lizanne is bi, her interest in dating Osa is in fact rooted in missing her twin sister, very openly so. When her twin returns, she neglects Osa and ruins the relationship. It's really easy to read this as her only really being into women as some sort of weird gross incest thing or because of the need for a female influence in her life rather than her just being bisexual. I like to talk about the technology when I talk about future books, and let's just talk about the technology in CCI. So, culture has changed in a bunch of really weird ways. Everybody now greets each other in German. They say, like, Danke as well. Uh, people are constantly vaping drugs. Books, TVs, and movies are out, they're all replaced by the Moat Aquarium, and we get so much lore about how that stupid thing works. It's like a fish tank that goes against your wall like a TV, except the images are three-dimensional thanks to nanoparticles. And I hope that the washing machine isn't being picked up by my audio. The benefit of this is never clear. Moat Aquarium's shows are like this reoccurring theme which take up large chunks of the book, but no one seems aware of the pointlessness of this device. It's a three-dimensional movie that plays out, but it plays out in front of you on the couch, like a 3D TV, which exists and never caught on. The benefit that it's a 360-degree view is nullified by the fact that it's still just a box that goes on your wall. I, I really hate everything about this because it's such a bad idea in tech, it would never succeed. And it's also so important to the world and mentioned all of the time. I feel like maybe the author thought he really, like, made a good decision. Like, he was proud of the Moat Aquarium. Whenever you talk while you're watching a show or whatever, it pauses and you physically have to say unpause to get your show to resume, which is one of the worst ideas of all time. On high-end moat aquariums, you can physically reach your hand in and feel the image, but also, if you feel it too much, it just glitches out, so you can basically gently stroke your images. Why? It goes against your wall and you sit on the couch like a modern-day TV. There's no benefit. In addition, in this book, we read out multiple moat aquarium shows, which are fully written out, shot for shot, and add nothing. These are plot-irrelevant moat aquarium experiences in the book. There's at least three of them. They're all basically comic short stories shoved into a novel that already has so much going on. I mean, they're kind of the best part in that they're so unrelated there's a comedic bit to it, but otherwise why are they in there? Um, continuing in this category of me just dismissing all of the ideas of this future, Everybody has a lily, which is a smart device that is in their ears. Police have something called an acorn. The lily is vague, I'm not sure if it's an earplug, implant, or earring, but you can use it as a phone. Most of the functions activate by tapping a certain number of times on like your ear, uh, giving a stiff command, sometimes you can whistle. And like in Moat Aquarium, this kind of technology basically already exists, except the lily doesn't have a screen. It can basically do anything that, like, a smart assistant, like an Alexa or Siri or whatever, can do, and that is it. 
It, that completely ignoring the fact that we have phones for a reason. We like screens and visual reading. But in this world, we've all just moved on with that. And it's one of those pet peeves about sci-fi and future technology, where it feels like authors aren't thinking properly about, would people actually want to use this? Does this already exist? And did it maybe fail to take off in the way that you're imagining it? Because I cannot imagine a future where we all agree that a 3D fish tank is much better than a TV or a book, and that having a um, virtual assistant that you can only talk to and has no screen component is perfectly reasonable and good. Welcome to my really yellow conclusion. You know, the lighting was already bad, and then kind of night happened, and... Maybe this is an exciting experience. You get to see me in, like, the daylight, and now you get to see me as the light falls, and we all succumb to the yellow. So, Corpus Chrome was a unique experience of a book. Like, maybe, like, seasickness I'd compare it to. Like, reading the meandering prose was like brushing through the matted fur of a very angry dog. And at the end, there was nothing. Like, this book is full of ideas. Uh, some of them are unique, but they can't connect a single dot. Robotic characters are flanked by a lack of robots, and for all, like, the foam and pseudopod-related innovation, the future feels regressive to entirely boring. The obsession with violence is very notable, like the author has a very specific kink for body mutilation. But along the long, fruitless monologue of, like, the hostage torture, a boneless, limbless human kept alive by tubes is given way more prominence than it needs. I mean, at the end of this triple POV tale, we're just sort of left wondering not what happened, but if anything happened at all, if at any point anyone had any impact, and if moon squids really do go to hell. <laughs>